Christina Harlow is the cataloging and metadata librarian at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She works with library data, usually but not limited to descriptive metadata. She likes experimenting with library data tools, scripts, and open platforms, and you can talk with her about practical implementations of linked open data. Tim Knight has been a cataloging librarian and metadata specialist since the early 1990s and is associate librarian and head of technical services at the Osgoode Hall Law School Library at York University. Tim is the chair of the KF Modified Committee and editor of KF Modified, KF Classification Modified for Use in Canadian and Common Law Libraries and represents Canadian Association of Law Libraries on the Canadian Cataloging Committee. His current research interests include linked data, machine learning, metadata applications, classification, cataloging, and when time allows, writes and plays a little music. Sarah Sutherland is the manager of content and partnerships at Canley. Before that, she worked, at, she worked in a variety of libraries, including those in a national full service law firm, the province of Saskatchewan, the National Research Council, and the Law Society of Saskatchewan. She's interested in developing open data standards to enhance innovation in legal information. Sarah writes regularly on topics relating to libraries, technology, and legal information. And I think that's it. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion on navigating linked open data. Uh, we'll start by talking a, a bit about a couple of linked data projects that were uh, the group of us have been working on, not together, but separately. And then we'll invite you to participate in the discussion. We hope you'll be willing to share some of your thoughts and experiences uh, engaging with linked data processes. Uh, for those of you who have, and I, I know there have been some, because it's been mentioned a number of times in the conference so far and help us work through some of our assumptions and expectations about how linked data might work in the library environment. However, if you find yourself not terribly chatty this morning, we do have a few talking points that we can introduce later on. So I'm gonna start things off by talking a bit about the KF, linked, or KF Modified Linked Data Project that my colleague Sarah Sutherland and I have been working on, and then I'll hand it over to Christina Harlow, who will describe her work using linked open data and a, and a local controlled vocabulary to expand uh, library authorities. Okay, so I have to double, double click now. So I'll begin with a very brief history of the KF Modified Classification Scheme, where it came from and why it's still a popular choice for Canadian law libraries. Then I'll run through the goals and objectives of the project, the various project phases, and what we've been able to accomplish so far. And I'll end with what we still need to do in order to complete this project. So a brief history of KF Modified Classification Scheme. Has anyone here heard of KF Modified? Yay, okay, a few people. So uh, this quote from a rather interesting article by Layman E. Allen, who was at uh, Yale University at the time, is referring to what he called the librarian's big problem. And he talks about the state of legal publishing in 1959. He wrote, oh, I can't see that slide. He wrote, the problem is the rate of growth in the production of written literature in both this country and throughout the rest of the world. The rate of increase in the amount of information that is published each year is simply staggering. The growth is so phenomenal that some sober observers have be are beginning to talk about the monster of literacy that is engulfing us. So the monster of literacy is an interesting turn of phrase and Alan attributes that to the then VP of research at Bell Telephone, uh, William Oliver Baker. So this was written about 10 years before the first official law classification scheme became available. And that was the 1968 draft of the American federal law, dubbed the Library of Congress KF schedule. And at that time, there was no standard classification available for Canadian law libraries. And the li Library of Congress didn't actually provide a classification scheme for Canadian law until 1976. So the librarian's problem was how to handle this monstrous growth in publishing using the various and largely alphabetical in-house classification systems that were in use across the country at the time. 
So when that uh, 1968 draft came out, uh, a small group of law librarians led by Shi Shun Hu at the University of Manitoba Law Library, who recently passed away this year, unfortunately, took that draft KF schedule and modified it in a way that reflected the subject-oriented systems that uh, were already in use in Canadian law libraries. And today, of course, the uh, Library of Congress has fully developed the classification system, uh, the law classification system, but KF Modified continued to be developed and is still a standard used in many contemporary law libraries in Canada. So one of the reasons KF Modified has endured is the positive effect it seems to have on the browsability of legal collections. The Library of Congress classification provides a classification schedule for each of the various legal, legal systems, which for the library user means that books on criminal law, for example, would appear in different places throughout the library. Resources on criminal law in Canada, Ontario, England, Australia, etc., would be assigned their appropriate classification number based on that particular jurisdiction. However, the nature of common law is that it essentially feeds off of itself. The law looks back and relies on previous judicial de decisions that have established a legal precedent in that area of the law. As a result, precedents in all common law jurisdictions may be worth considering, uh, depending on the legal context. So for lawyers work, working in common law jurisdictions, it made some sense to group legal subjects together so that potentially related legal precedents could be more easily consulted. KF Modified was designed to do just that by dividing common law res resources first by subject and then by jurisdiction. This approach also drew on the experience of law library users familiar with the characteristics of the, of the subject-oriented systems that have been developed locally in their own law libraries. Uh, so that's another reason why KF Modified took hold and remains a popular classification standard today, at least in Canada. The primary goal of this project was obviously to create a version of the KF Modified scheme that could, as linked data, play a role in organizing legal resources in the semantic web. It seemed like a small, manageable chunk of work, something that could be done in a reasonable amount of time, and it offered opportunities to learn more about the technology and processes involved in creating linked data. After all, theory is one thing, but practical application is a whole different story. Aside from that basic uh, goal, the project also, also meant we'd be able to publish a web-based version of KF Modified, which would make it easier to manage and edit, easier for law catalogers to use, and make it potentially more attractive, a more attractive option to consider for common law libraries working outside of Canada. And finally, we hoped that we could contribute a methodology for creating and using linked data that might benefit other technically minded librarians who find themselves without the necessary skills or resources to develop a full scale linked data project. As somebody suggested in notes from the recent Laudland Summit in Sydney, one of the many obstacles to getting projects off the ground is a, a perceived division between developers with the technical skills and researchers and subject specialists who realize the potential of this work but no, don't know how to get started. So far, my research has led me down many lovely garden paths, which is why I'm very grateful for conferences like this one, which provide wonderful opportunities to get together and cross-pollinate, if you will. But I digress. <laughs> so back to the project. We outlined the main project development phases like this. Develop an XML schema appropriate for KF Modified classification. Convert the print version of KF Modified to XML. Review and consider the Library of Congress classification linked data service and their use of SCOS. Convert the XML version of KF modified to HTML and RDF using XSLT. Extract, convert, and reconcile a marked record set using the linked data version of KF modified. And finally, make the project publicly available. So the first thing we had to do is to get KF modified out of the legacy word processing software that it finds itself in today. Uh, so we wanted to get it into something more useful like XML. We decided on XML because it provides a lot of flexibility 
and allows the possibility of converting uh, to a variety of other formats, for example, maintaining the print version, HTML, or RDF versions. However, developing an XML schema that accommodated all of the quirky print conventions that catalogers take for granted proved to be a major challenge. Human readers can see something on a page and fairly easily interpret and understand what's intended by what they find there, but translating these nuances into something more machine actionable was something else again. Take, for example, this section from the original print version. This shows an internal table that can be applied later for classif classification of particular professions. There are actually two tables here, table A for single class numbers and table B that's applied to cutter numbers. So if the pr profession is represented by a class number, you add 0.3 for resources on malpractice. If it's represented by a cutter number, you add three to the, to the end of that cutter number. So malpractice of engineers would be classed at KF 2928.3, and dental malpractice would be classed at KF 2910D33. So representing the table B in XML might look something like this. After a lot of testing, sample coding, and trial and error, we did finally settle on an XML schema uh, that we could use. And I realize this code, you won't be able to see any of this code, and, but uh, I'll post this stuff later and you can take a look if you're interested. So this is the main uh, XML schema and that calls a couple of complex types, one for KF modified concepts and then one for KF modified classification number. Uh, you can illustrate that schema something like this. So at the top is the relatively simple KF modified concepts with the primary concept and secondary, repeating secondary concepts. And then a more detailed um, area that covers the KF classification number, uh, the, the class number, the tables, and the cutter numbers. So with the schema in place, we were able to start converting the word processing file and coding it to some XML. The original plan was to accomplish this primarily using regular expression magic, but our first pass yielded us something like this, which was not nearly as useful as we had hoped it would be. Ultimately, the variability in the original print version meant that we had to start coding XML manually. Below was softened a bit by creating a collection of macros that could fairly quickly express the various XML elements, but this still meant we were only able to fully code a short excerpt of the schedule from KF4480 to KF4200. Fortunately and gratefully, uh, Galen Charlton at Equinox Software, the open software li library folks, has recently volunteered to assist us with this final phase of the conversion pro process and has made some uh, great progress for us so far. So the next thing to do on our way toward an expression of KF modified classification in RDF XML was to review the work done at the Library of Congress classification link data service. This is certainly a logical place to explore, but we discovered that their link data implementation was a little more complex than we thought we would likely need. LC references their own authority databases through MADS and MODS, and we would like, of course, like to take advantage of that work uh, and those connections, but we thought we could do that by mapping to their uh, use of data elements use through SCOS. So we focused on that. Uh, so we developed, we started um, mapping our XML elements to SCOP and SCOS, and this is the beginning of the chart that we developed for that. So in order to accomplish the planned conversions, the next stage of the project meant uh, a better understanding of XSLT and what it can do. And since we'd considered HTML as something we may, might offer catalogers uh, as an alternative to the print version, that seemed like a logical starting point. Uh, I began working through Jenny Tennyson's book, Beginner XSLT 2.0, which I would recommend to anybody who are, is starting to learn anything about XSLT. It's very well laid out. 
So this is uh, an excerpt of the style sheet that I uh, developed. Again, probably too small to read. And this is what the HTML looks like. Uh, it's all color coded so I could make sure that I was getting elements in the right place and so it might not be that fancy when we actually put it out there. So getting to something like this uh, representation here, which is uh, RDF XML and the elements mapped to SCOS is a, a little bit more challenging uh, with XSLT. I've had some success using scripts that Eric Hansen posted in a project he was involved with at, at uh, North Carolina State University Libraries. They've made their project files available and I'd recommend his article, A Beginner's Guide to Creating Library Link Data that outlines the steps they use to create their organization name link data project. And in, ten, in anticipation of the test reconciliation against the KF modified link data service, uh, we extracted a marked record data set for about 100 records and uh, worked through the conversion process, that conversion process. Um, I'm not going to go through these details, but eventually, uh, basically we used a mark edit to convert to mark XML and then a couple of uh, XSL style sheets from the Library of Congress to convert to uh, RDF XML. So that's been our progress to date. Uh, we'd hope to be a little further along by the time this conference rolled around, but uh, we hope sharing these experiences is useful to some of you. And we still have a ways to go. We need to complete the conversion to XML uh, and then work out the best way to convert RDF XML using SCOS. And then we need to get the classification scheme up as, linked data, as a linked data service that we can reconcile our data against. So here are some of the references. And again, I'll post these slides, or I, I guess Access may have post those and contact information. And I'll hand it over to Christina. Okay, hi, I'm Christina. Uh, I am a metadata librarian at the University of Tennessee, and this is my very first trip to Canada, so thank you for bringing me up here. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about a project that's sort of developed in tandem with some ideas around how we want to reconfigure our data ecosystem, which I know is a bit of a precious term, but I kind of like it and couldn't think of anything else to call it, um, that goes between platforms and discovery layers and indexing engines and that sort of thing, and where local authorities and then eventually national authorities will play in that. So here's a, a link to these slides, which are very simple, but um, these slides and a bit more information on the ideas I have around where I think authorities are heading in uh, linked open data and RDF modeling. Um, please go check it out, and if you disagree, you will have plenty of time to ask questions or critique, or you can tweet or whatever. Um, and then there's also links to some of the uh, resources and projects that I'm going to be talking about and some of the tools as well. Okay, so. Like I said, this started with the idea that we were migrating from a bunch of different systems. Um, we were migrating our IR, our digital collections platform, our catalog, all at the same time. Uh, we were trying to figure out some better data practices at, during those movements, which are still ongoing. And uh, I took that time to really try to reconsider how we could handle some local data practices. And this included a local uh, vocabulary we had that was part of the Great Smoky Mountains Regional Collection. Uh, and as you can probably tell from that name, the Great Smokies Mountains Regional Collection really focuses on the culture of Southern Appalachia. So it's a lot of concepts that maybe are represented in other uh, bigger vocabularies, but not to the detail that we want. And that the content specialist behind the collection wanted to be able to add further information behind it. So this led to the creation of the database of the Smokies, uh, which at core is a list of citations assigned uh, simple terms that can help researchers who focus on that region focus in on what they want to read or, or what they want to know about. And you can check out what exists now publicly. Um, it's just a Drupal plugin with a database in the back end. The terms are, are loosely put into a taxonomy um, that's basically just a text file. 
and you tab over if you think it's a child of something. Uh, and those are applied pretty haphazardly to other data sources as well, though we want to see those um, used in non-marked collections since there are digitized objects from the Great Smoky Mountains Regional Collection. And we would like to see those also used in our mark records so that we can say that DOTS is not just focusing on citations that happen to li live in this data store over here, but can really uh, start to expand um, the linking of resources related to these concepts. So some of the limitations with working with dots beyond that it was just uh, a list of terms uh, as text. Um, there's no identifiers, uh, which is a classic problem. The hier hierarchical structure uh, was not machine parsable, really, uh, and it was not even explicitly declared. Um, it was put together as the content specialist thought of a new term that they wanted to apply to an article or a resource that came across their desk. Uh, so it sort of grew organically, and with that has a lot of issues as regards modeling. Um, and there's also the issue that I thought I listed here, but maybe not, uh, that a lot of the DOTS terms that end up being applied to resources outside of that citation database haven't made it back to the actual term list. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to figure out as well, and I was able to pull in those terms and enhance it with this work. Uh, and also the DOTS terms, the structure of the, the, the label itself, loosely mirrors the Library of Congress so that, but they're not exactly the same um, when there is a, such a term in the Library of Congress authorities, meaning the facets can look kind of wonky uh, or that they perhaps don't make sense outside of the context of dots. Um, and that's when you just have a city name, but you don't bother to say that it's in Tennessee as one very classic example. So the preliminary goals for this project <laughs> And this project really was sort of a, a let's get together after work and sort of hack on this, let's talk on the weekends kind of thing. So it's not very formalized, it's, it's very fluid. Um, but there was interest in, in saying, let's what, first get this hierarchy formalized. Let's figure out what we want to capture here um, and go ahead and get it machine readable in some way. Uh, then take the terms and assign unique identifiers so that we don't just have uh, a city term floating out there. Um, and then the text strings, the labels become something we can feel a bit freer to update as concepts change or as we start to reorganize this to be machine parsable. Uh, we wanted to build out reconciliation services for using this in MARC and non-MARC metadata. Uh, I work a lot building automated reconciliation services for all kinds of variety of data sources just because uh, the, the amount of stuff that we're working with is growing at an exponential rate and during a migration where we're moving from sort of Dublin Core to mods and kind of RDA mark to RDA mark <laughs> or kind of Dublin Core terms but not really to whatever we decide for the institutional repository. <laughs> I wanted to go ahead and, and in my enhancement and migration process do reconciliation with the local vocabulary. So additionally, we wanted to be able to pull in subject terms used for dots. This is where I was saying that not all of the dots terms are in the actual term list at present. Um, a lot of them live in the marked subject headings because it goes to a different cataloger to create those records, and that cataloger does not um, have, well, did not before I arrived have a pipeline back to dots to get those terms back in that she used. Um, I wanted to be able, and this is something that's still in progress, but I want to be able to allow the content specialist to go in and add more information. Um, right now, the terms really are just you capture the label and you relate it to a citation, and, and Bob's your uncle. Like, that, that's it. Um, so I, I want to be able to, to let them add more information, but in a structured way. Uh, because just having lots of information doesn't mean, I don't think that's necessarily a better situation. So we're trying to plan this very well. And then finally, um, actually not finally, but more, most importantly, we wanted to allow DOTS to extend external data sets. And this is where our traditional and some non-traditional library authorities come in. Um, so with GeoNames, we used a lot because uh, they have much better um, coordinates than Library of Congress subject headings or Library of Congress name authority files. And when I say better, we know exactly what element they are in the record. We know how they're encoded. And so they're much more consistent to pull from. Uh, they also have a better hierarchical structure for geographic terms. So we wanted to pull in geonames uh, terms, concepts, 
uh, and relate those to dots. And oh, that's supposed to be a Library of Congress, but I just got to low, so I guess I got annoyed with the Library of Congress before I finished that. But <laughs> the Library of Congress terms as well, we wanted to build off of id.lock.gov, which is the linked open data um, versions of the Library of Congress authorities. Uh, and this just allows us to extend a lot of the uh, resources we already have described that don't use perhaps the dots vocabulary. It gives it a, a bigger data ecosystem to live in. So in building this sort of taxonomy, sort of just list of terms to a vocabulary, we also eventually want to get it to an ontology where we can do reasoning on it and it would be accurate. Uh, vocabulary is where we're starting to put some relationships between concepts, but we, we wouldn't put it into a reasoner and, and you know immediately agree with what happened. Uh, and since we are working on trying to do this and extending uh, external vocabularies that are largely outside of our control, um, it, we have to move very carefully in that merging of ontologies and reasoning. We want to find ways to pull the updates that we give to the dots terms. Uh, when that dots terms is related to an external vocabulary, we want to find that and find a way to pull that out. Uh, to help seed the authority records that are one cataloger who can do NACO updates, can then use that to eventually get it back to the data source, since, since that is our one route currently to get updates back to the Library of Congress. And using this work to further explore the idea of exploding library authorities, and that's not meant to sound extremely violent, although I guess it does. <laughs> it's more about how can we use RDF modeling to make authorities much more accessible um, and pervasive and more about capturing conceptual data that really helps our, our descriptive process uh, instead of having a data store over here that we happen to point to every once in a while. I'm looking for a more integrated uh, workflow. So the external vocabularies that were focused primarily on Library of Congress and GeoNames, um, I've already covered that. So the text reconciled uh, the first thing we did is we took the list of terms and I dumped them into Load Refine, which is a linked open data refine, uh, open refine, um, which is a really great tool, although I'll warn you that it's no longer being actively supported, but it is a really awesome tool if you want to check it out. Uh, so we dumped it in there and we went ahead and reconciled it against LCSH and GeoNames to capture, if there was one, the relevant URI and label for that external um, term concept. And then for the Library of Congress name authority file, it's just so big that it's been very hard to do reconciliation work like that in Open Refine. So um, just like two weeks ago, <laughs> I was finally able to find a workaround for reconciling against that to do the same process. And that was using linked data fragments and HTT files, um, which I'm not gonna go into here, but I'm happy to talk about more with you one-on-one -on -one or during the questions. And there are references to all of those uh, projects in the linked post at the beginning. So I was able to pull in the URI and the label. Um, and then I went ahead and created a simple SCOS RDF, SCOS RDF. Now I'm thinking about it because we realized we said SCOS and SCOS differently. So SCOS, I'm gonna go with that. So we created a simple SCOS RDF with in triples um, because Load Refine has the ability to export to RDF in triples once you create a skeleton. Um, we declared dots, dots as a concept scheme. All the terms became concepts. In dots, we gave them URIs, um, which were then made into URLs by the platform that we put them in, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we, if we did have a reconciliation option, we gave it a SCOS close match between the external vocabulary and our dots term. Um, and the reason we did that is we couldn't, so the text strings match, but did the concepts match? And I felt like dots was small enough that I wanted to pull that aside and then have the content specialist say, yes, that is an exact match. No, they're just related. And so they went through and did that. Or they're going through um, a lot of it now. And then when it was an exact match, we would turn in, uh, pull in the external vocabularies labels to be all labels if it wasn't uh, an exact text string match in some way. So once we created that document, um, we threw it into Fuseki, the Sparkle server. Uh, and based off of that, uh, Scosmos, which is a vocabulary um, discovery platform browser, 
Uh, we, that fed off the Sparkle endpoint from Fuseki. Uh, Skosmos is a browser developed by, I think it's the National Library of Finland. Um, I know it's uh, someone in Finland, and it was created in order to support their government data, all moving to linked open data vocabularies. Um, so it's a very cool open source tool. Oh, National Library of Finland, yeah. I'm glad I put that in my notes, because I can never remember. Okay, so at present, um, we've got a proof of concept of SCOSMO so they can interact with the data and understand why SCOS modeling could help, why, that really, like, why we're working on these relationship building. Um, we have uh, the test instance uh, for them, and we also have the ability to visualize relationships in other ways now that we do have a SCOS RDF doc. Um, and I should say, I mean, this is a great thing, and we can now reconcile all of our external metadata against uh, dots and pull in a URI, which is really helpful. Um, it has inspired the dots content specialists and librarians to really expand what they want to include now in those descriptions. Um, and it's everything from the exact length of hiking trails to the location of the cemetery where someone is buried um, to the ingredients in that particular version of moonshine, which I'm very excited to uh, capture in some way. Uh, it is, so it expanded that, and it's also expanded how we're going to start thinking about working with external authorities um, through relationships in our own local uh, vocabulary and ontology development. So this is just a simple example, and it's kind of small, so I probably will le uh, lead you to the link of some of the in triples. Um, if you look at this slide, you realize I used prefix when I shouldn't have, so please don't slap my wrist. I was just trying to think of fitting it on the slide. Um, but I, I like this example because it is talking about Teleco, which is a Cherokee village. Um, and one of the particular issues we've had with a lot of Cherokee place names that would show up in Southern Appalachian work is that they don't have authority records in Library of Congress authorities. But there are authority records for the village that, lives, that is there now. And there are authority records for the archaeological dig on the site. So something we've tried to do is say, okay, so this is not an exact match because it's not this Cherokee village. But how do we then discuss the relationship between the town that is there now? And how do we discuss the relationship between the archaeological dig and that village? Um, and right now it's just simple SCOS related until someone much smarter than me figures that out. But this is one of the examples of where um, just relying on external vocabularies to try to capture this information can um, erase history. So future goals, we want to be able to have better editing. Right now, um, <laughs> I, they have to edit the doc directly, uh, although they've sort of fallen in love with load refine, so maybe we'll just stick with that for now, and I can do the transform every time. Um, we want to enhance the hierarchical relationships, uh, look beyond SCOS for properties and classes we want to use. Uh, which again, uh, needs to be done carefully in consideration about how that would display. But in order to capture something like if we had our own coordinates. Um, discuss pulling in the full data set. So this is where I'm trying to figure out, we, we've got this, this vocabulary that has sort of become a negotiation layer between our digital resources and the external vocabularies that are starting to be available as linked open data, but are not necessarily accessible for us to edit or update or work with in in a reciprocal way. So this sort of allows us that. And we're beginning to think now, do we want to pull in those external vocabularies uh, somewhere in our data ecosystem and have our own local negotiation with it via this sort of ontology development? Um, and one of the questions about that was even, do we want to just pull it all into Fedora and make each concept an object that just doesn't have a binary attached? Um, and I think I'm against that at this point. I, I would prefer have a separate triple store, but. It's sort of a bigger question we fell into. So that's, this, that's the link again, and that's my Twitter account. Um, and thanks for listening to that. So at this point, <laughs> thanks. OK, good. So we've got time to now take questions. We've got prepared questions in case you're being especially shy. But we hope that you will have responses and questions, and Sam will run around and, and um, have a hand you the mic if you have responses to this. Otherwise, we're going to just start going through our prepared questions. Um, before I start, is there anyone who immediately wants to kick off the panel discussion with something they have on their mind?
All right, so I'm going to just skip to the next question, and then when you're ready, <laughs> you can tweet at me or <laughs> um, you can uh, flag Sam down. So just to read these for people who might not be able to see it, the first question we're going to talk about is the suitability of library classification schemes and or controlled vocabularies for the semantic web and related applications. So I'm going to just kick that to you guys first. I think that library classification schemes in many ways were aimed very much at the physical arrangement, especially something like KF modified. Uh, it's, it's really just based on putting the books in a findable location. Um, and that can work to some degree, and I think that there's, there's room to contribute to the semantic web with these existing classification schemes, but it's not a universal ontology that would actually allow someone to navigate the world. It's something that will allow you to navigate things that are published in books. Uh, so, I think it's a contribution, but I don't think that it will be some kind of formal endpoint that will uh, not need to be linked to something else if we want to actually navigate the world. Uh, so I think that it has a great potential for dividing, uh, allowing libraries to provide better access between the historical and in-person and physical information that we do have with the semantic web and breaking down what is to me kind of an artificial barrier between that print content and uh, online and world content. Uh, but I don't think it will be kind of all the ontologies we will ever need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, oh, I just think it's interesting that, I mean, we place a lot of stock in our classification systems because they do help us control our collections. Um, mm -hmm. But when you try and take this out into, you know, the sort of universal conceptual space that is the semantic web or what, what, what the semantic web might become, uh, we have to remember that these classification systems were really built on literary warrants. Like it just whatever came into the library, okay, we need, a, we need another spot for that. Um, so they're not ontologies in that way. And plus they were developed by generations of librarians. So there isn't really, uh, strong consistency or policy uh, development um, as these things grew. Um, and, you know, a classification system is just that. I mean, it just classifies, it classifies things. So uh, I, I kind of like um, David Weinberger's book, uh, Everything is Miscellaneous, and he had a little a passage in there where um, he sees the he wants to see an opportunity where you could come in and sort of choose your classification system depending on what you were trying to do at that time. So if you're a lawyer and you were looking for uh, particular information on a case you were working on, then you could uh, go into it uh, with that perspective. But if you're uh, just somebody who wanted to find out what they could do to lodge a complaint against their landlord, uh, it might it might be a very different kind of classification or at least a pathway through the information uh, to lead you to what you wanted to get to. So I think we, we need to be careful about that. Like classifications aren't the, aren't the be end and uh, like aren't aren't solutions necessarily, but they are contributions, like Sarah said. So I just wanted to raise that issue. That's why I think we uh, we work together. All right, I. I wasn't sold at first, but I think our presentations really work together as I've gotten to know more about your project and you guys' areas of expertise, because it, it, you guys focus very much on this is how the classification system is developed, and this is really where we can expose and, and make it link better in a wider data universe. It, my approach to it is very much, well, how are we going to actually cr uh, work with those disparate units? Um, is that going to become a, a SCO's concept, obviously, but a SCO's concept in what sort of platform and where is it going to be stored? So a lot of what I think about with classification systems and controlled vocabularies um, is not always focused on the logic therein, but how we can then take those discrete uh, concepts out and relate them back to a lot of the digital objects that I happen to work with, um, which is why I think we're kind of a complementary presentation. So. 
Well, there's that, there's that point too, because uh, these classification systems were developed to describe books. So exactly. when you start trying to describe these smaller units of information, like web pages mm -hmm. and paragraphs and what have you, how applicable is that going to be? So it's, it's interesting. Okay, so I am going to switch to the next question, but you guys should definitely raise your hands. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't mean to preempt you, but uh, all of you, both of your projects, is, is strikes me, what you have in common is you're both working in a hinterland that isn't well served by the metropolis, either in the KF <laughs> section or in the Appalachians. Would things look different to you if, if you were in the metropolis, if you were in Library of Congress, if you were working in an area that, that didn't seem to require all of the, the special work that, that has gone, in, gone into your areas before you came along and tried to make it linked data? Or is everywhere a hinterland and that's what linked data is going to teach us? Library of Congress would never let me touch their data. <laughs> So it would look different because I wouldn't get to do anything <laughs> with it. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I can approach that. So I feel like a lot of what our project started out was is because there was this very specific area that was not well covered by existing projects. Um, and it was small enough that I felt like it was a manageable way for us to start experimenting at UTK with uh, ontology development. Uh, but the further along I've gotten in working with this, the more I've seen the flaws in the bigger systems and projects that exist. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily related to the fact that they have been well, I, I don't know if it's related to the fact necessarily that they have big infrastructure and systems. I, I almost feel maybe they're hindered by that because they have a lot of legacy platforms and data and standards and policies to navigate when trying to move into a world that is so much more flexible and changes how you conceptualize describing objects from the very beginning. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I feel like it, we started with this project because it was small and approachable and definitely a hinterland. But the more I've gone into it, the more I've seen that, I wouldn't say necessarily that, that everywhere is a hinterland, but everywhere is a data silo, and they're just starting to realize that. Yeah, and we want to connect to the metropolises. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Without having to reclassify our entire exactly. collections. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, say, if you have a system over there that's working in this part and my system is working in that part, well, why don't we put our efforts together instead of working at cross purposes? And I think with RDF, uh, one of the best practices is if a class or property already exists, use it. Use that instead, don't recreate it. Right. And I think that applies very nicely to when we're talking about classification, classification systems or controlled vocabularies as well. It, it has to be done carefully because there is a lot of lo logic that's not necessarily visible when you're working with that, um, classification systems or controlled vocabularies. But I, that's, I think that's a nice policy or best practice that we haven't seen applied much uh, outside of the hinterlands. Yeah, was it the, the special snowflakes uh, presentation <laughs> that was talking about a, a core a core amount of data and then you kind of append the special snowflakes to that data? I think that's probably the best approach. Well, and it makes the special snowflakes interact with everything else. Right. So you can have mm -hmm. your little local system or in our case, you know, a system that was made 50 plus years ago for a particular need and it doesn't mean you have to be in a silo forever. Exactly. Without having to actually re rearrange things, you get to have the benefit of having the special snowflake arrangement without having to forego the benefit of the wider access. Absolutely, I would agree with that. I mean, that's one of the benefits that I saw right away with RDF modeling for this is because it is flexible and extensible, and so you can better support snowflakes. And they still become avalanches, but... <laughs> at least you know what kind of avalanche it is. All right, is there another question from the group or I'm gonna scoot on to the next slide. 
Okay, so this has a quote, um, the key to our professional future may be redefining ourselves from people who catalog books to people producing metadata for resources access through portals, online catalogs linked directly to the resources being cataloged. How do we see these projects as part of a functional redefinition? Um, so I'll, I'll kick that to you guys first. Uh, well, this is a quote from Aaron Cooperman, who's a law cataloger at Library of Congress, and uh, I was glad to see this come come across the uh, listservs because I think it's it's pointing to the fact that we really it's just like the presentation yesterday from the uh, the OCLS group, I guess, mm -hmm. of retraining their catalogers to think in terms of uh, discrete data elements instead of creating the pristine uh, bibliographic record that, that the profession has been keen on doing up until this point. Um, so our project is trying to feed into that kind of, of mentality where um, there aren't records anymore. That this is just, the classification piece is just one, one part of the navigation or the information flow and, and can help or aid navigation, um, but it is only one piece of it. So um, I think we do have to start thinking more in terms of metadata instead of creating these uh, bibliographic records. Yeah, I, I tend to go um, even one step beyond that and let's just think about it as data and how do you work with data. Um, and that's why a lot of the data tools I'll end up playing around with and sometimes using in workflows um, came from sometimes big data, sometimes a data library, and sometimes completely not library related data munging work. Um, but as regards uh, d redefining this, so I, I just see myself as a, a data person. Like, I don't, I, I try to figure out how we can make the catalog, well, all of the data together work together, hang together in the discovery layer. So I don't necessarily try to see this is the catalog and that's the mark data over here, and this is the digital collections and that's the mods data over there, and here's the institutional repository. I mean, functionally and with uh, regards to the systems and platforms, we still have to think of it that way. But when I'm creating data policies, um, procedures, best practices, I, I try to have a holistic view. And I think that's where we can start to see some of the changes in job descriptions and workflows and that sort of uh, interaction. Um, and as regards, so I supervise five catalogers who've been very brave and nice with me throwing a lot of random projects at them. <laughs> 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 Which, I, I don't know, maybe sometimes you have Mark brain and you just wanna work on something different. That's the hope I'm, I'm uh, working off of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, they've been very uh, open to Learning, I, I wouldn't say that we're ne I'm necessarily trying to get them to think about how the data is changing in the, at a very high level or in the back of in the back of the system. It's not really the back of the system, but um, I want them to think more about how they are doing their editing and what interface they're working in and how that can be uh, adaptive and reflexive. And it's not necessarily done now. It's not a discrete unit. It's not done now, and you just move on. But um, starting to see that this controlled access point over here is very much related to this controlled access point in a different system. And to do that, it's really focused on getting them to work with a whole new suite of tools instead of the OCLC connection editor or the ILS editor or perhaps some sort of ingest form that's attached to your platform. Uh, and this is a big question that we have and this is a big part of uh, the DOTS ontology development work is figuring out um, what the editing, how editing should happen and what the platform should be um, for moving forward with this sort of work. And it's, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> this question doesn't really apply to me because for me this is a, it's a passion project, it's something I want to do, it's not um, really anything to do with my day job at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, are there questions from the audience or I'm gonna move uh, along? I don't see any questions on Twitter either, but okay. You guys are too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I can, we can also take you know feedback or anything else you want to say about what we're talking about. So let me check our time. Okay, good. 
So the next question we have is what kind of data infrastructure do we need to make linked data in libraries useful? And how does this involve moving from modeling or proof of concept to usable tools? And what does this process include? Um, and I think we're right, uh, for my work, we're right in the middle of moving from proof of concept to usable tools. But um, yeah, I'll let you guys kick that off. I just think it would be wonderful to have some kind of linked data machine, if you will, like Archivematica, where you just ingest uh, bibliographic information and it spits out linked data at the other end. Um, so I'd like to see something like that developed, but I'm, I'm not mm. a developer, so I, I can't really do that kind of thing. But I'm grateful for tools like Mark Edit and uh, Terry Reese is working on this Mark Next project, which uh, looks very promising. I haven't actually uh, experimented with it yet, but um, that's a way to reconcile uh, certain fields in your Mark records against um, linked data services primarily, I think, well, not just the Library of Congress, he's also dealing with the VF and bringing things back and, and dropping them in the subfield O, but to full URIs as opposed mm -hmm. to just identifiers. And I think that might be a nice step. And it's a fairly easy thing to do. I mean, any cataloger can, uh, can work with a mark edit. Uh, so something along those lines, I guess. And just, I'm gonna go off completely on a tangent, but mentioning the inclusion of URIs in Mark Records, and I'm very, very happy to see that Mark Edit's doing that. And mm. thank you, Terry Reese, if you're like listening to the live yes. stream or ever <laughs> watch this for developing Mark Edit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so something I've been playing around with a lot recently though is pulling in the, the URIs for all controlled access points in MARC records um, using Katmandu, which is a series of Perl modules uh, developed somewhere in the wilds of Europe um, for working with data between platforms. Um, and between that and a couple other ways that we can make the data exposed as Sparkle endpoints, which is like what we are all working towards with our projects, I, right. I feel like. Yep. Um, it, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a Sparkle endpoint, but exposed in some consistent way. Um, there are a whole suite of tools and scripts and modules and libraries that can then let us work with the MARC records or the mods or whatever. And, and pull in those identifiers. Um, and something I've been very interested in to see the development of is uh, Stephen Folsom at Cornell University, uh, along with many others, but him the most vocally, at least on Twitter, um, has been talking a lot about capturing authority URIs versus real world object URIs. So authority is like, this is a link to an authority record that will describe this thing that we're talking about. And then this is a link to an identifier that should be that thing we're talking about. So we might think of like an authority record versus a, an ISNI identifier or something like that. Um, and I'm very curious to see how that plays out and what, how that's gonna influence uh, wherever Mark goes that will be RDF based, whether that be BibFrame or other. So, mm. sorry, that, I just, I, yeah, yeah. spontaneous uh, reflection <laughs> based off of uh, the subfield, so. Right. I think part of, aside from library cataloging processes, which I think are uh, obviously important mm -hmm. and, and an, an important element of usefulness, I think that if we start exposing some of these ontologies and letting people tinker, that that will be uh, kind of go a long way toward letting people decide what they want to build with it. Because um, there's, there's library purposes, there's you know research specific purposes, but I think that there's a lot of room for a, a lot of development around these things and, and just making them open and explorable. Uh, so that would be kind of where I would like to, to see it go. And I, it, tinkering is like, I'm glad you used that word because that's how I describe how I learn. Um, and with the catalogers, I, I saw that someone was asking about cataloger rescaling or, or how do you approach linked open data if, if you're new to it. And I think both ways are through tinkering. Um, let me set up this platform, this editor, and this uh, discovery layer that you can then mess up and break it and have the data have completely wrong reasoning and have the data completely show erroneously for a second to then see what the effect is. And when you get it right, you can understand how much more enhanced the end product can be because it's linked out to so many other data sets. Um, and I know this project has been mentioned before, but I really think someone who's new to linked data, uh, the Linked Open Jazz project, the Linked Jazz project is a really great example of how a collaborative, open, extensible project can build something great. So 
Uh, sorry, I was trying to address some of the questions coming and, and what you're saying as well. <laughs> we have a question from the floor. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, actually, uh, a comment based around your, your question about when are we going to move to usable tools. Um, just going to connect two points. One is in our organization, and our organization probably doesn't look much different than yours, the number of people we have who could sit in this room and follow these conversations, I can count on one hand. The number of tinkers, linked data players, whatever, less than one hand. The number of people we have in our organization who are highly trained and highly involved in servicing the ILS is still something I would need all four of my, my appendages to, to count the people who do that, even though, there's, even though over time there's been, a, there's been a ratcheting down. So that's one thing. The other thing is that a couple of years ago I went to one of those lunch and demo things for Alma, you know, Ex Libris Alma, and you know, they dutifully went through it, and I said, well, wouldn't it be nice if the interface that we have to train so many people to use could do some of these things, could actually become, you know, in very simplistic terms, sort of a metadata authoring place where you could do all of these complex things that would interconnect with yeah, other yeah, systems we use. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, at least kudos to Ex Libris for not just completely misunderstanding the question, because other vendors would have just looked at me like I'd just spoken, you know, some exotic language from another planet. They, but they said, oh, you know, that's coming in 2018. That's on our roadmap, and it's going to be in, you know, Q4 2017, which might as well be, you know, 2030, 2050, because it's never going to happen, because they're going to solidify that product, and they're just going to keep selling it as it exists forever. So until we change the structures in our organizations to make the people who can do this more numerous and connect them to tools that will let them do it without a lot of really high level understanding, because frankly, we don't have a lot of us in our organizations that are people who come with multiple degrees and the desire to tinker and the desire to learn. We have a lot of people who just want to come, plug in, do work, and do meaningful work, but aren't really you know, innovators. And that's, and that's just normal, and that's an organizational dynamic thing. And so it's, it's less about what makes, you know, how to make the, the stuff easier to do, and it's more about organizational change, I think. But that's just a comment, and I don't know if that resonates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I would immediately respond to that are a couple points. So uh, yes, we have people who are very specialized in a particular area, and that particular area is not necessarily portable to a lot of linked data practices at present. What I, what I try to do in my situation with catalogers who are so used to mark cataloging, and not just mark cataloging, but a specific area of mark cataloging, um, is to then find a way to nurture that expertise in the linked data program that I'm building. So one example of that is our uh, maps cataloger, who's very, very passionate about map cataloging. Um, getting her to then work on some of the digitized maps in a, a both a mods editor as well as like a test bib frame editor that I keep hacking on and I probably shouldn't be, but I just keep doing it anyways because I wanted to get her feedback on how it applied moving from one to the other. And since she had that base expertise to still cling on to, I felt like a lot of the technical insecurity fell away and that she got interested in the actual, but it, it's hard. And there are people who are like, you know what, I'm just very good at this and this is what I'm gonna do. And so yeah, <laughs> okay, we'll have fun. Um, we'll build like a Lego castle around you while you're doing that. But um, I, it's, yeah. Uh, on, the <laughs> on the topic of Alma, which we actually migrated to, um, I was surprised at Iluna at how many of the talks were saying we were pulling our data out of Alma and using open source tools, just to be entirely blunt. Um, like Mark Edit, which is freely available, or like a lot of uh, PyMark or uh, PerlMark, I think is what it is in, in, for the PerlMark library, a lot of tools that already exist and, and doing the data munching there and then just pushing it back. So I wonder if eventually um, some of the ILS vendors will see that we just need more accessibility to the data <laughs> and less of the uh, Byzantinian, uh, here is your metadata editor and we're going to rename what, uh, how you deal with items and this sort of stuff. I doubt it's going to happen, but a girl can dream. So, <laughs> sorry, I just co-opted that. I'm, uh, if, no, that's perfect. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so we've got about five more minutes. If we have other questions, or um, we can just go to the next question, or other comments. Um, that comment was great, uh, both of them. So thanks. Okay. Uh, so what roadblocks have we encountered? And I, I, I think that comment really 
helps kick that off. But what roadblocks have we encountered? Yeah. The sheer amount of work involved. <laughs> that that we have this, you know, this really irregular data set that we have to, act, like, th th this whole manual conversion. It's just, it's, you know, to convert a, a 300 page word perfect document into a mm -hmm. dynamic data standard is just, it's a very daunting. It seemed easy. <laughs> it seemed like a great idea. Started. It was going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, I think I originally in the project plan, we, we allocated like six weeks to it. Mm -hmm. It was just going to be done. It was going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, people always underestimate data munging, and I feel um, like my really bad uh, comparison for it is that when you're eating a bowl of pasta and you're really hungry and you're like, I'm going to totally eat this whole bowl of pasta, and then you get halfway through and you're full and you still see so much pasta, I feel like data is the exact same thing. <laughs> How big are your bowls? <laughs> I, 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 I'm a pretty heavy eater. So <laughs> um, no, so I like I, I will pull all the data out. And I'm like, sure, I can totally script this really awesome recon service and be able to like handle all of the data. And it's not even just a question of the sheer amount of data that I decide I can work with. And I, I have broken my work computer so many times. <laughs> like just, just yeah, um, IT loves me. So, uh, but on the other hand, it's. I, I tend to think the modeling will be, um, I, I won't say easy, but easier to decide. And I, I really scaled back on that thought in the last year or six months. Um, trying to negotiate how you want to model objects is a much thornier issue that I've run into um, than I thought I would. So that's one of the roadblocks. Also, uh, time and the amount of people I have to um, help me with this because uh, as much as I'm trying to throw some of this work to the content specialists and the catalogers and maybe eventually to some of the library platform developers we have, um, it does involve me building out much more than a proof of con uh, concept. It involves me building out a sort of infrastructure and a sandbox they can play in and helping them reskill and get comfortable. And then I would have some help. So I feel like I'm sort of coming off the peak of that ebb of extra work to try to get other people involved to help with just the amount of data work there is, but it, it's still an ongoing process, so. Yeah, and, and I'd say I, I'm certainly a tinkerer, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not a developer, and, and it, it seems like you need a lot of development, developer chops to get these things act, uh, actually off the ground. Mm -hmm. And part of that problem too, I mean, there are people, uh, I mean, people are willing to help, it's fantastic, but I often don't even know what question to ask. Yeah. And or I'm going down some path like learning how to install Ruby on Rails or or or, or should it be Python or and that's all great. It's a wonderful learning experience, but that takes a lot of time too. And then you might end up in a place that doesn't really help out in what you're trying to do. So I, I re was really uh, I really appreciated Sam's um, presentation yesterday with the sort of mentoring, developer, uh, researcher mentoring um, idea. And I would love to get involved with something like that or a code reading group or, but again, it's time. I mean, we all have uh, jobs too and we have uh, other responsibilities. I love, uh, I don't, I, I love the statement. Um, I don't know if what even, like what question to ask. Cause I, I feel like that, that really crystallizes a lot of the issues you run into when you're doing work that rest at the intersection of so many different departments functionally. Right. Um, so a lot of times you will have just straight up communication issues. I mean, here we are talking about classification systems and controlled vocabularies and a cataloger speaking to a developer who's speaking to a sysadmin might all be using the same term and completely thinking about it different ways. Right. Um, and so communication has been something to really keep in mind as well, I, I, as well as uh, helping people know that this should be a space where we are experimenting and we're trying to figure out things together. Um, so I often try to cite the hacker school rules, which was built for hackathons, but I think they really apply well to this sort of like experimental work going on in, um, in our, our departments at our university library. So, but I think that's a great question or a great point to crystallize yeah. that. So we're at the end of our time. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, I hope it was helpful. So thanks.